If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Psalm 103. I'll be preaching on uh, this subject, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. And my my goal this morning is simple. I, I have one goal this morning, and that is to get our eyes off of us and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Okay, so a lot of times, I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times I struggle with maybe remembering the gospel, remembering all that God has done for me, remembering that he's good, remembering every single thing that he's done for me because I get caught up in my circumstances or I get caught up in the worries of this world or the troubles of this world. And I I, I think that you're like me in that. And so I'm I'm hoping to apply the word of God to this situation. And, And sometimes we're so guilty of whenever we get into a tough circumstance, whenever life happens, we tend to navel gaze or look down or focus on ourselves. But what we really need to be doing is to take our eyes off of ourselves and fix our eyes on Jesus. And so that's my goal. That's my one and only goal this morning. So if you would, Psalm 103, verse 1, stand with me if you would to honor the reading of the word. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Is anybody thankful for that this morning? Nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as high as, excuse me, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are this morning. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done for us, that you are doing for us, that you're going to do for us. I pray now that you send your Holy Spirit to anoint me for the work at hand. I pray that you'll bless the teaching and preaching of your word this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit move in this place in a fresh way, move in this place in a convicting way, a comforting way. God, I pray that you comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I pray that we lift up Jesus this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> so verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So to bless the Lord means to make, his, to make him happy. It means to delight his heart, to, to please him. So the question is, what makes the Lord happy? What makes him happy? What pleases him? What delights his heart? I I jotted down just a couple things. One thing that makes him happy is total commitment to him. If you look at this psalm alone, it says all, the word all, nine times in this psalm alone. He is not looking for half-hearted commitment. He's looking for all-in commitment because God is an all-in type of God. Joyful submission to him. He, wants you, he doesn't just want you to check off your box and say that you read your Bible or you went to church. He wants you to joyfully submit to Him and serve Him. He's not just after religious activity. Isaiah 64, 6 says that your righteousness is as filthy rags. Amos 5, 21 says that I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Hear me, guys. 
God is not after your religious activity. He's after your heart. He's after all of you. He wants all of you. He gave all of Him for all of you. And I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on you. I, I'm trying to say that Jesus wants better for us. He wants more for us, guys. He came to give us the fullest life possible. He came that we may have joy and have it to the fullest. But He did that so that we would give Him everything. He gives us the fullest life possible if we give Him everything. We empty ourselves so that He may fill us up. If you want the fullest life possible, you have to give everything that you have to the Lord Jesus. You have to trust Him with everything that you have. And by the way, what would our church services look like if we did that? Just think about that. If we took this seriously, what would that look like? Notice how He doesn't say, Bless the Lord, O my lips and my lips only. Bless the Lord if I'm feeling like it. Bless the Lord if I feel good. Bless the Lord if I'm excited. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. David is writing to his soul. He's writing to himself, and what he's saying is, he needs to be reminded that he needs to give God everything. Why? Because our default position is to hit cruise control. Our default position is to go through the motions. And so what he's doing is he's reminding himself, give him everything. Give him everything. What do you do to get your heart ready for worship? For me personally, I, I have this playlist that I listen to um, on the way to church or while I'm getting ready, and it's, it's an assortment of hymns and psalms that are sung and um, worship music and Christian hip-hop and so I, I do that to get my heart ready. Sometimes I preach in the shower. Some people sing in the shower. I preach in the shower. Sometimes Taylor comes in and he's like, hey, yeah, that was pretty good. You ought to write that down. <laughs> it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about all that God has blessed you with. If God never did another thing for you, he would still be worthy to be praised forever and ever if he never did another thing for you. But he daily loads us with benefits. His mercies are new every morning. God doesn't owe us that. We don't deserve that, but he gives it because he is a gracious God. He's a good God, and he loves you. He gives us new mercies every day. Verse 3 says, He forgives all your iniquities. If you are in Christ, every single sin is forgiven. Fully, freely, and forever forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Now, you guys didn't seem that excited about that, but forgiven. It's gone. It's over with. It's paid for. It's finished. That's a little better. We'll get there. We're just getting warmed up, right? He, he talks about sin in three different ways in this psalm. He uses the word iniquities, he uses the word sin, and he uses the word transgressions. Iniquities would be taking something and twisting it or perverting it. To sin would be to miss the mark, and to transgress would mean to go too far. Almost like the word that we use today called trespass. So what he's saying here is he forgives all our iniquities. Every single one. He heals all your diseases. Amen. He heals all your diseases. Verse 4, He who redeems your life from destruction. He redeems your life from destruction. Verse, Psalm chapter 40 says that He pulled me up out of the miry clay and He set my feet on the rock. Because of our sin against God, we have deserved, we have earned destruction. We have earned hell. We have earned uh, condemnation. But God in His grace, but God in His mercy, through Jesus Christ, has snatched us up out of the grave. He snatched us up out of destruction. He snatched us up out of the pit. And He set our feet on the rock. What is the rock? The chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And on that rock, go ahead. And on that rock, He will build His church. The word destruction, another word for it would be pit. And in the Hebrew, they would say sheol. 
Anybody ever heard of Sheol? And when the Hebrew got translated to Greek, they turned the word into Hades. In, in America, we say Hades. And we truly deserve that because of our sin against God, because of our trespass against God. We are lost sinners headed for hell, and He snatches us up. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Now David is writing this, and he was the king, and he probably knew something about crowns. He probably had crowns. He probably had beautiful crowns. Being from southeastern Oklahoma, the only crowns that I know about are the ones at, K at uh, Burger King. Right? Any, can I get an amen? Yeah. But he knew something about crowns. But he's saying the greatest crowns that he could receive are the loving kindness and tender mercies of God. That's what should mark us as believers. We should be marked by loving kindness and tender mercies. Verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. He satisfies our mouth with good things. So think about all the things that he does for you. Every single thing that he's done for you. And above all that he does for you on a daily basis, the greatest thing that he satisfies you with is Jesus. The greatest thing that he satisfies with you with is himself. You see, the stuff that he gives you on a day-to-day -day basis, that's, that's just a cherry on top. That's just the gravy on top of the biscuit, so to speak. He gives you himself, and he's enough no matter what circumstance comes. Paul said that his grace is sufficient for me. Jesus is enough for us, and he satisfies us. And when we're satisfied in Jesus... Our youth is renewed like the eagles. What do eagles do? They soar and they fly. Paul said, my outer man is going downhill. My outer man is being destroyed. In other words, gravity wins, right? But my inner man is being renewed day by day. Why? Because he was satisfied in Jesus. Are you satisfied in Jesus this morning? Verse 6. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Verse 7 says, He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. So what I think he's trying to do here is he's talking about how God shows righteous and justice to everybody, to all who are oppressed. He shows grace to everybody. He gives grace to everybody. He loves everybody. But he made his way known to Israel. He made his way known to Moses. And so I think this isn't a, a, a straight line, but, but I think this can be applied here. God loves everybody in this room. He loves everybody who's ever lived, but he has a different type of love for the people that are his. He has a different type of love for his people. He has a saving love for his people. And, and, and you might think, well, doesn't he love me? He does. And you can be a part of his people if you turn from your sin and trust in him. That can be you. You can be partakers of that. You can enjoy that. He shows us righteousness and justice. And you might say, well, there are so many things, so many people that are oppressed, and the wicked just seem to get away with it. They just seem to get to do what they want and there seems to be no justice. There seems to be no righteousness. I'm telling you, every sin will be paid for. Every right will be made, every wrong will be made right. Every account will be settled. God's going to have his vengeance. You can trust in that. He made it known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. God has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us through creation. If you read Romans 1, you read Psalm 19, he reveals himself through creation. He reveals himself through conscience. You read Romans 2 and you read Ecclesiastes. The law is written on our hearts. But the most important way, the most crucial way that God has made himself known to us is through Jesus. You want to see what God is like? Look at Jesus. Colossians 1, I think it's 13, says he is the, no it's 15, he is the image of the invisible God. 
God the Father is invisible. You want to see what that looks like. You want to see what a perfect life looks like. You want to see how to obey the laws. You want to see how to obey the commandments. You look at the life of Jesus. You want to see the attributes of God played out. You look at the life of Jesus. The Lord is merciful and gracious, <clears throat> slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Notice how David doesn't say that these are things that God does. He says that these are things that God is. He's not just a God or a guy who happens to be merciful. He happens to be gracious. He happens to be slow to anger sometimes whenever his kids aren't on his nerves. He is merciful. He is gracious. That's who he is. It's not what he does. It's very crucial. Merciful and gracious are, are two different terms. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And grace is giving us that which we don't deserve. It's important that you see the distinction there because not only does he not give us what we deserve, but he gives us something so much greater than we deserve. He doesn't interact with us based on who we are. He interacts with us in spite of who we are. He doesn't save you because you're good. He saves you because he's God. He's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. L let me just ask you, does that describe you? Ouch. I know for me, one of the biggest struggles is I'm quick to anger. I get stirred up because if people were just like me, then everything would be okay and we wouldn't have any arguments. Everything would be all right because everybody else is wrong, right? Abounding in mercy. I wish that that were me. By the grace of God, one day that may be me, that I'm abounding in mercy. That's my prayer. Verse 9, he will not always strive with us. Some versions say he will not always chide us. The word that we would understand would be rebuke. He is not always rebuking us. You're doing this, you're doing this, you need to change this, you need to change this. Now the Lord does rebuke us. Hebrews 12 says he rebukes whom he loves. But if you notice, he's gracious, he's merciful, he's loving. He's not always constantly rebuking us, and he could be. Amen? He could be doing that to us because we deserve that. Nor will he keep his anger forever. Praise the Lord. He will not keep his anger forever. Anybody ever growing up, you know that your parents are mad at you and you are trying to hide from them? Like, wait till your dad gets home. Wait till your mom gets home. Whatever it is. And when they get home, you're kind of like sidestepping them. Like if they're walking right here, you might walk over here. Anybody ever do that before? Because you know that they're angry with you and you are a little bit tentative. You're not willing to run to him or to her. You want to kind of stay away. The Bible does speak of God's anger. It does speak of God's wrath. But his anger is for a moment. His anger is for a moment. His love lasts forever. We don't have to interact with God in a scared way. We don't have to run away from him. We're called to run to him. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. This is so good. <clears throat> because of the cross of Jesus, he does not interact with us based on what we have done. He interacts with us based on what Jesus did on the cross. And if I remember right, Jesus said, it is finished, and he wasn't joking, he meant it. He doesn't deal with us according to our sin, he deals with us according to his son. The blood of Jesus has covered your sin if you're a child of God. Is anybody thankful for that this morning? Oh my goodness. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins. Romans 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. 
Nothing can separate you from the Father's love. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Notice that he he does give mercy to other people, but his mercy is great towards those who fear him. How high are the heavens above the earth? High. Really high. Like you can't throw something that high. Like you can't see that high. Like you can't think about that high. It is a boundless mercy that God gives us. It's a boundless love that God gives us. You like that song, right? Boundless love. (laughs) Great mercy towards us. As far as the east is from the west, you guys know that east is one direction and west is the other direction? I don't know which way that is, but east is one way, west is the other. So they're going in opposite directions. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is so good. I I know what I'm about to say, and you don't. You're You're going to. Just listen. I read a story about an old lady, godly woman, member of a church, And she keeps having these visions and dreams of God. And she goes and she tells her pastor, and you can tell she's not a Baptist, right? She's having those visions and dreams. She's not a Baptist. But she goes up to her pastor and said, Pastor, I keep having these dreams of Jesus. And the pastor's like, oh, okay, cool, that's awesome. Kind of writes it off, and she comes back about a month later and says, I'm still having these dreams and visions about Jesus. Well, what are you guys doing? We're hanging out. I'm, I'm worship, worshiping him, and we're just talking, and I'm, I'm resting in him, and it's just great. I'm having these great visions and dreams. So the pastor, like most pastors, is maybe a little cynical at this point. He's like, okay, that's cool, you know. Kind of hoping that she doesn't bring it up again. She brings it up again and says, Pastor, I'm having these visions of Jesus. And he said, you know what? Let's do this. Next time you have a vision of Jesus, why don't you ask him the last sin that I confessed or repented of? She said, okay, I can do that. Just a sweet old lady. So it comes back a couple months later, and it had been a while, so he's like, okay, got her on that. She's not going to talk about it anymore. And So she comes up and says, Pastor, I'm having these visions and dreams. And he said, did you ask him what I asked, what I told you to? Yes. What did he say? He said he doesn't remember. And it's not that God got hit in the head. It's not that he has amnesia. It's that he has blotted them out. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. He's cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. The word pity here, it could be confused. He's not saying, oh man, I feel sorry for you, and yada, yada, yada. It's, it's that he has compassion on them. He has compassion on Christians, on his people, as a good father would have on his children. How many of you fathers know that you're going to be merciful to your kid? You're going to be compassionate with your kid. You're going to come alongside them and be with them through whatever struggle it is. Some boy broke up with me. You're going to have compassion. Something happened at school. Something happened. You're going to have compassion. When it feels like their their life is falling apart because something happened in their life and it's not a big deal in the grand scheme, but to them it's a huge deal. As a parent, you're going to come along and have compassion. In the same way, God is a good father, and he has compassion on his children. He has mercy on his children. In verse 14, stay with me, I'm almost done. Verse 14, I think this is the key right here. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. For he knows Before you were in your mother's womb, he knew you. Before the foundation of the world, he knew you. He knows your frame. 
Why? Because he's the one who framed you. God knows you. God loves you. And this is an odd expression. He says, he knows our frame. He remembers that we, not were dust, are dust. Which means he doesn't know us and love us because of who we are. He knows us and loves us in spite of who we are. There is nothing good in us. There is nothing to brag about in us. Whenever we go to heaven, we're not going to be singing about us. When we're in heaven, we're going to be singing about him who saved us. We're going to be singing about the king who's on his throne, not us. One of the most meaningful conversations I ever had, I started preaching at the age of 18, and I think I had just turned 19. And I was working at a church camp in Tallahassee, southeastern Oklahoma. And this guy... Um, invited me to come and and run with him. As you can tell, I don't run anymore, but I used to. Um, And he wanted wanted to spend some time with me. He wanted to run with me. And this guy, I'm telling you, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. More degrees than Fahrenheit. He was an engineer. He got saved. Now he has his PhD in um, theology from a good seminary, not a kooky seminary. And he said something that I'll never, ever forget. We, we went back and forth, and we were talking a lot, and, you know, talking about preaching and talking about just a, a lot of different stuff. And as I was leaving, I said, Pastor, tell me one thing that I can chew on. Tell me one thing that I can learn that is maybe the most important thing that you would tell me. He said, Brooks, remember, no matter where you go, no matter how many degrees you get, no matter how many people you went to the Lord, no matter what size your church is, Remember that you're nothing but a patch of dirt that the Lord formed and breathed life into. Our nature is to be filled up with pride. Our nature is whenever things start going well, we give ourselves the credit. When things start going bad, we blame God. We don't blame ourselves. And what he told me is, remember that you're nothing but a patch of dust. And you might say, well, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of mean. But whenever I begin to get filled with pride, I remember you are dust. Not you were dust. You are dust. But God formed you. He breathed life into you. He saved you. He redeemed you. He daily loads you with benefits. All those things that we talked about, he did that because he's good, because he loves you, because he's God. He doesn't save us because we deserve it. He doesn't save us because we've earned it. He saves us, he redeems us, and he keeps us by grace alone. 